Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's once again time for our Internet Forum lecture. And uh, this time we will have uh, talks by uh, Lasse Eriksson from CargoTech. And uh, before that, uh, from a multi-year veteran of the predecessor of this course, Telecommunications Forum, Professor Jukka Manner. Please. Can you hear me? Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, so my name is Jukka Manner. I'm a professor here at Aalto, Aalto University Department of Communications and Networking. And uh, Jarno asked me to give a talk here and, you know, I could pick my own topic. So I picked the topic that interest, interests me the most. So actually talk about the evolution of mobile. And uh, I put, picked, picked this topic and title 2G to 5G and even talking about the fall of mobile. Let's see whether I'm able to convince you about the fall here, probably the mobile, but the fall part. So this, uh, this data, uh, this presentation draws from data from our netitutka slash netradar mobile crowdsource measurement service. So we have almost 300,000 app, app downloads and thousands of people who actually measure their mobile network, mobile connectivity, but also VLAN using our technology and the data, data comes from a database, and from that we can do for some of these types of talks and, and research papers and so forth. And I will be focusing in this talk mostly on the Finnish market. Well, first of all, this is talk here is in Finland, and uh, we have the most accurate data from, from my home country. But without you know, further you know, delaying you to the, from the interesting part, let's, let's start by looking at the evolution of mobile, mobile coverage and radio coverage. Here is one graph about uh, 2G in Finland. So this is how many, how many percents of our users every quarter since 2013, actually when they try to use the internet or measure the internet, sir, internet technology, internet connectivity, then they actually were in a, 2B, in a 2G network instead of 3G or 4G. And you can see that, you know, 2013 on the left side, you know, five, six, seven percent of our users run into actually only 2G connectivity and nowadays it's less than two percent anymore actually are under 2G. Uh, let's add here 3G, similar type of trend that you can see that actually back in the days 2013, 90, 90 percent of, our measure, of people measuring with our system actually run into 3G and nowadays it's only around 40% anymore. So some people can do the math that, you know, for example, uh, last quarter of this year that I have the data Q3, 2% 2G and, you know, 40% 3G, so the rest is 4G. And uh, actually, the, there's a few interesting things here that you should draw, you, can, you should look at. Um, Q3 was a uh, pivoting point after that, actually, we see more 4G uh, uh, measurements in our data than 3G anymore. So actually, that was when 4G kind of became the dominant, at least on the Finnish market, based on our data. Uh, the second interesting thing from this figure you can probably look at is, is that after Q1 this year, the growth has disappeared. 4G was growing up to Q1 this year, and after that, our data shows that it hasn't grown anymore. It has actually come down slightly a bit. So something's happened. Um, let's look at the data on an operator level. So that was country averages. And uh, in order to not make this a comparison between who's the best and who's the worst operator and for your focus going on these operator brands, I don't use the operator names here. I use different colors. I change colors in slides so because I want to make the point about the differences and changes in the market instead of, you know, looking at, you know, which brands here. But at least looking at this figure, for example, you can see that, you know, the one I used red here was a few years ago uh, almost 20% of their customers <coughs> were actually under 2G coverage compared to the other operators which has, you know, few percents of their customers actually were under 2G, and one operator had 
much more. And that has changed so that nowadays they are pretty much even. So all of them have roughly, you know, 2% of at least all data shows two, only 2% 2 anymore under 2G coverage. Um, <clears throat> using the same uh, colors, looking at the, at the trend of on the per operator level of 3G, you can see basically similar trends. There is some, some difference and here actually lower, you could, I could say lower means better. So for example, in this graph, uh, the uh, dashed green line is actually lowest. So actually one operator clearly has uh, less 3G users than 4G, than the other competitors. And if I add here 4G, then you can see that there is one operator who seems to be having at least this year more people under 4G than the others. So for, if you are under the customer of that green operator, you are probably more, you are more probable to have a 4G connectivity than, the, than if you are a customer of the other two operators. And you know, the green arrow is also slightly more, if you look at it actually in the growth direction instead of these two, uh, two the red, red and yellow, which are actually pretty much stagnating. So one is growing, the other two are more or less, you know, flat nowadays, at least this year. Um, coverage typically turns into download speeds, and that's of course something that you probably more, most, most of you, you know, run into is, you know, do you get download speeds? Do you get your web pages and stuff, you know, coming to your device? So looking at uh, the Finnish average, this is what in Finland people actually nowadays, or at least you have, have received up to, you know, Q3 this year, so this data is up to September this year. Again, kind of similar trends that you can see a strong growth up to, you know, end of 2015. Uh, but then at least our data shows a decline. And this is, this is across all radio technology. So this is an average of all radio technologies, 2G, 3G, 3.5G, 4G, whatever you want to have these. So actually growth and then it stopped. Uh, let's go to the operator level to see if we see any, any, di any di uh, differences on an operator level, for example, in, in the network performance. So this is, again, one operator out of the three, three big operators in Finland. And you can see, for at least from this figure, that uh, there is a kind of steady growth if you look at it. it, it's mostly, you shouldn't kind of look at the individual quarters. I mean, there are changes bound to happen because we don't control who's using our system. So if there's more or less users and different users, then there are changes. But the interesting thing is to look at the trends. And at least for this operator, the trend is upwards. Even, even this year, the trend is actually upwards. Uh, let's add one operator. Uh, which was, seemed to be at least last year when I was doing similar talks that there was a clear winner, if you will, last year. That winner has changed. If you look at, for example, average bit rate, so there was one operator who was clearly better than at least, you know, here the yellow, I use yellow color. And then uh, that actually has something, I don't know what's happened, but at least those, so those kind of download speed that we saw last year, don't, we don't see them this year anymore for that thing, one operator. And then we add the third one, which is roughly in the middle. So, which I use here, uh, red, red color seemed to be doing pretty okay in 2014. 2015, the situation changed, and now the situation already is changed. So, you can see there's a different the color, which is the highest, highest one has changed. So, now the green operator is currently having, having a, a more steady growth compared to the others. Of course, you can do your own judgments, and of course, you get, to see, you can, you get this slide, so you can come back to them and do your own on, you know, thinking based on these. Um, let's continue the story about this download space a bit. And uh, let's also divide them based on 3G and 4G. So here's, here's uh, for one operator, uh, the performance we see, or well, not we see, our users see uh, in 3G network. And it's been pretty stable since, you know, let's say end of 2013, you get roughly between five to six megs 
on, on average on, a three, on, the, on the 3G, net, 3G network, but that hasn't really, there was some decline this year, end of this year, like, you know, the Q2 and Q3. Let's see what the Q4 this year shows. Is it going still downwards, meaning that capacity is re really running out, or is it actually, you know, coming back, coming up? Um, adding one, another operator here, you can see also there's actually surprisingly big differences uh, between these two. So the red one I used here is clearly, you know, lower in terms of, you know, average speeds that people are getting over 3G compared to, to that uh, slight yellow orange color. And then we can add the third one. And here we also see kind of a similar trend that there's two operators who at least this year have been, you know, doing <coughs> more or less worse than for a while and one, one operator who has more or less bypassed the others in, sim in trends. Of course, here you can see that, you know, for Q3 this year, then uh, the red one is almost the worst in terms of 3G, as you know. Worse than in several years, uh, yellow one also, but the green one is, you know, doing pretty okay. So if you are a customer of the green operator in these arrows, in these lines, you know, you're you're, you should be better off than with the other two. Um, let's add 4G, which is, of course, as already presented, is the dominant, uh, dominant um, technology nowadays. Um, this is a 4G of, again, I use the same colors here, so you can see the 4G, net, 4G uh, capacity or the average bit rate that we see our users. Um, since 2013, um, 20 bit, roughly between 25, 30 megs, surprisingly stable and uh, no steep, you know, decline at the end of, the, of that graph. So it of, of course fluctuates, uh, but uh, not very dramatically, if you will. It's surprisingly stable. Um, here we can add another operator who at least in the past seemed to be having, you know, better, their customers seem to be having better connectivity and better, better speeds clearly, but then, you know, something has happened this year and actually it's now lower than that, uh, which I use green, green color here. So there are kind of changes at least in our data in how the network performs if you, if, you, if you believe download speed is a network performance metric. If you don't, then, you know, then you might have other, other, other views on, you know, of course, we could look at, um, for example, network error rates, that how, how reliable the network is, that how many, for example, of our users trying, trying their, tech, their network and how often, for example, it fails. So turning back into network reliability. And then we, I add, again, one third operator, the third one here. Um, noteworthy here, for example, is that um, this red operator, um, clearly dominant if you look at the average bit rates earlier in our data set from 2013 onwards. And nowadays, the uh, trend is more downwards than upwards. So, so, seems to be indicating that, that uh, well, there's, as I said, the green one is relatively stable. It's not the highest, but it's relatively stable. Uh, yellow should, should probably do some trend analysis, you know, deeper, but uh, it's not at, at least growing, and the red one is clearly coming down. Of course, let's see what the, what the Q4 this year will show. I, I didn't take October because it was only one, one month out of this last quarter, so I thought that I'll, I'll end it at Q3. But maybe I'll do some analysis later on during, you know, Christmas holidays. Um, so that's kind of the view on download speed. So there are changes. Uh, in general, they are most, mostly downwards, for, except for one operator, if you look at it. Of course, you can, as I said, you can get these slides, so you can come back to them later on. And of course, this, this presentation is online, so you can do your own analysis. But at least it seems to be that 
two, two operators seem to be having, um, how, would I, how would I put it, you know, capacity challenges. And one has less, in, at least in, you know, based on our users. But then, um, you know, download speeds is typically what people, you know, always see and, you know, what operators sell. And, you know, that's the, that's the magic number that, you know, how many megabits. But the upload is also increasingly meaningful. So download speeds, of course, you know, looking at web pages, you know, streaming videos and so forth. Then uh, that's fine. But upload, for example, if you think about no, nowadays, the, you know, new, the area of social media, then you want to share stuff. You want to share, you know, pictures. You want to share videos. Then you really need upload. Or if you want to use, for example, cloud storage, you want to save your pictures in a cloud. And if you have, you know, megabit upload speed, then, you know, good luck, you know, storing your pictures on a cloud server. You know, it'll take you the night and, you know, you're, if you are using a mobile device, it better be plugged in because it will run out of battery before the pictures are saved. So actually upload is also very meaningful. And uh, so let's look at upload. Here is um, the general trend in Finland. And this is, uh, um, it's again cr growing up to Q1 2016. Then at least our data drops and then it grows back. Of course, the Finnish, in Finland, there is one trend that affects, unfortunately, really between Q2 and Q3, which is summer holidays. And when the Finns go to, you know, country ho homes and country, country homes, then typically the mobile coverage is worse in your country home than in the city and downtown areas. So that, that we can see it in our data that if, you had, if I was drawing, you know, monthly averages, then you could see that every, every year around, you know, June, July, the download speeds around Finland are smaller, and typically in, in cities they are higher because people leave the cities to the country homes, meaning that there's less users in the networks in the city areas, meaning that everybody gets higher bit rates. And that we can see that, you know, easily in our, in our trend analysis. But look at, let's look at, you know, per operator, and this is where I actually found slightly more changes. I'm, slightly bigger differences and of course you know would need to look in deeper into our data does it show why but uh, here is one operator you know out of the three big ones or the only three more or less um, so upload speeds across all radio technologies so I didn't in this this analysis you know do differences between 2G 3G 4G but looking at you know what you on typical typically get it has grown up to, you know, early this year, and then it has, you know, stabilized. Not much growth, actually, in terms of upload speeds for this one operator. Let's add another one. And we can see that, actually, there is a huge jump for one operator in terms of uplo upload speeds. So one is really stagnating around six. The other one is, you know, has passed 10 and is approaching, you know, drop, one drop there and then again back around 10. So it actually there is a big difference in terms of percentage. And here is the third one do, done similarly. So you can actually see that there is one operator who, at least based on our data, has serious issues with upload. So if you are this, you know, orange operator's customer, you know, good luck. And if you are not, then, you know, you're in, at least, you know, the red one and green ones are pretty even currently in terms of averages that our people are, that people are, are see, we see in our network or in, in our data. So this is actually the one of the graphs where there is a surprisingly big difference. And it has something to do with the network and potentially network configuration and, and so forth. Um, okay, so these are the bit rates and numbers and so forth. But then the question, of course, at the end, comes that, you know, what do people actually need? Compared to what people are sold and, or what they are buying, depends on, you know, use case. Then the question is, you know, what's enough? You know, one, ten, talking about download speed, 100 megs, gig, gigabit, you know, what's enough for you? Of course, you know, if I ask a question from the whole audience here, you know, I will get probably, you know, 50 different answers. But uh, I would almost say that 10 megs, gets you really far. 
Of course, it's probably very, very low, and you would expect that, hey, 150 mex, you know, that's the minimum people should be getting. But if you think about it, you know, most of the services you are using, you know, probably social media services, you know, different web applications, you know, streaming media and so forth, then with 10 megs, you can basically get anything working. I mean, if you have 100 megs, your Netflix doesn't work any better than with 10 megs. I mean, the screen quality doesn't really change if you have 10 or, you know, 100. Of course, if you are looking 4K, but that's not, you know, here yet, especially on mobile or tablets. So actually, with 10 megs, you can do a lot. And there are a lot of studies that, you know, if you get, you know, big higher bit rates, and do, you pe do people actually see the real difference um, in, in, in their everyday experience? If you, get, if you have 20 or 100 meg connectivity, then do you really see much difference compared to 10 megs? So, then of course, the next question you might ask is, you know, so, okay, so 10 megs is, is good, or, or is, you know, kind of um, enough for most of your real use cases. I'm not talking about hardcore gamers who, for, for whom every millisecond counts in the game of losing and, losing and winning a game. But look, let's look at the availability of 10 megs on a per operator level. So the, here is one operator. Uh, so the percentage of people or of, of the measurements in our database that actually uh, get, give you 10 megs or higher. So how many percent of the measurements in, in a certain operator's network in our data reach 10 megs or higher? It, if it's 10 or 100, it doesn't really matter. At, so at least 10. Then uh, again, it has grown up to end of last year, but then it has dropped. Q4 last year was the peak, and then at least our data, in our data, it actually drops, you know, significantly, and is still on the decline. Adding another operator, um, last year was not very good for that one operator, and then, but now, let's say this year, they are pretty much even. And let's add the third one, who is actually surprisingly bypassing the others. So actually this, you know, uh, red operator in this, in this graph is actually, was not kind of uh, in any term leading, if you will, you know, two years ago, last year, but nowadays is, of course, the difference is you know, like 5% in our data set, but you know, it's still significant that it's every quarter this year in our data set. Uh, there's one paper we uh, did with, uh, you know, two, two PhD students and then uh, us three professors looking at the NetRadar because NetRadar has a questionnaire also. Some of, hopefully there's a lot of our users. If not, then hopefully there will be a lot of our users. And there is also a questionnaire that we are interested in understanding both the technical performance but also people's opinions. So what do you feel like? We see kind of people's network speeds and, you know, how reliable their connectivity is. And then we try to understand that the subjective nature of people. And that's one paper. It's not available yet, so I'm not kind of allowed to share it. But it, it will appear hopefully this year, but it's anyway accepted for publication. That's where we look at really the subjective and, and uh, objective numbers together. But let's look at, uh, let's do a simple analysis because that paper has a lot of math. I mean, there's more math than I can, you know, digest myself. It's done by two brilliant PhD students. But uh, let's look at the you know, simple questions. There's five questions in our, our questionnaire. I, I didn't take the, uh, in this presentation, didn't uh, develop into mobile devices and the quality of mobile devices. I could, I could do that, but I'm looking at the connectivity and operator side. Um, here's again, you know, three different operators. We are asking how satisfied people are on the, the speed of their connectivity. One to five stars, and this is the average, average of those. And there is one operator, the red one in these graphs, which is doing best in every quarter. So we started doing these questions back in spring 2015. So now there are six, six consecutive quarters we have data, data from. And then there's a green, green operator here, which is, you know, doing, uh, except for the last quarter, is actually, you know, trailing behind the others. I'm using the same colors in all these uh, so that you can see kind of one, one interesting phenomenon. 
Um, well, actually, in the here also you can see that the drop, for example, in the red one, there's a, there's a, there's a big drop. Of course, you can you should look at the scale on the axis. It, I just zoom in the three from three to four um, stars or the average. But anyway, there's a drop from the green. Well, the green has a small drop, the yellow one also, but the red one has a huge drop in terms of uh, people satisfaction. Um, then we are asking how satisfied people are on for uh, just for in video streaming on their mobile devices. And there again, you can kind of see similar trends that actually the uh, people's opinions and kind of expectations have come down or not expectations, but the opinions and you know how they how they see their connectivity. Then that has actually come down this year for all operators for the green one less so, but for the red one much more and even the, the yellow one is coming down. Uh, then we are asking about, you know, how satisfied the users are on the availability of the connectivity, not really about the speed, but, you know, is it available? And there we actually see, uh, again, kind of interesting trend that the green operator, even though it's trailing behind, it's actually increasing satisfaction this year. Q2 and Q3 were better than the previous quarters, while these two others, of course, well, the red one, red one achieved a peak in Q2, but the last quarter actually dropped, dropped down. So there is one operator who seems to be kind of uh, increasing, maybe, you know, better the user satisfaction, and then these others are maybe, you know, losing, almost losing customers. And there's a, as a final questionnaire, we're actually, actually act, asking that, would you recommend your operator? And there we also see kind of two operators coming down and one coming up. The, the green one here is still trailing behind, but, see, but it, it, it is on an upward scale. So interesting thing will be to look at, you know, Q4, that what is the relationship in Q4. Is the one with, with, the, green, with the green color here actually bypassing the others, or is it, you know, or is something else happening? But that that will will know, you know, you know, around Christmas. But anyway, one is kind of coming up. Similar trends that we see in the bit rates and the average download speeds. There is one that is coming up, and two that are, you know, more or less, you know, on a downwards angle. Um, then, of course, the question is, you know, that the trend is downwards in in on average. Then. Um, is it so that investments are not enough anymore to support people's use of the internet over the mobile? That, is it so that we are actually, at least, you know, us as, a, as customers, we are running into the same in, into situation that we are more hungry for data over mobile and actually the operator networks are not, except for one operator, I would say, are not enough to actually support our needs because, uh, you know, trend is mostly downwards. And of course, if you think about it, you know, data usage grows all the time. I mean, uh, I think the current statistics is that, uh, especially in Finland, I mean, we are using more than 10 times the more data than in, in the EU average. Of course, the you know, reason here is that, you know, we have this all-you-can-eat buffet. So most of, most of the people here in Finland have all-you-can-eat, you know, data, data packages, so, you know, we just use it that, you know, people switch their fixed connectivity to mobile because it's, you know, it's cheaper and in many cases faster. But anyway, you know, it's over, I think it's, it's over, even over 10 times more data in Finnish mobile networks than, for example, in the, you know, in the EU on average. So of course, you know, if you have that much data going per, per capita, then, you know, it, it has to be seen somewhere. Of course, you know, you might wonder that, you know, okay, so what now? You know, what are the paths forward? As I see, there's maybe three paths forward. Um, starting with one, you know, if capacity, capacity is eno isn't enough, then probably, you know, investments in the network are, are on their way. The question is, how do you fi fund that? Do you take the more money from the shareholders or do you take it from your customers? 
So meaning that you know, can you can you can you affect pricing and can you get higher price from your services? And by that doing invest investing in a network and getting better better services to to, to your customers. Of course, in a competing market like Finland or any mobile market, I mean, the first player who raise, rises, you know, your prices will will be hit, and then the others will follow later on because it's a good idea. Of course, you know, the other option is you know just decrease the load, you know, end of all you can eat buffet, or you start doing bit bit rate caps or you know data caps. I mean. Either you get more capacity or you drop the you know, usage. So that's the other, other, other one possibility in the future. Of course, a third option is, you know, the more, more probable one is just do nothing or increase your marketing budget and people will buy into you. And, you know, when, when, when they have bought into it, then, you know, just keep them happy by, you know, offering them, you know, free T-shirts and so forth. Um, then, you know, closing in on the end of my talk, uh, let's jump to, you know, the 5G. So I kind of analyzed in this talk how, I, how our data shows that the evolution of 2G, 3G, 4G in Finland and kind of the downward scale. So another question is, you know, well, everybody talks about 5G, so will 5G save the day and, you know, you know it, it will bring us rescue and, you know, everybody gets, you know, as much as they can eat. Um, no, sorry. 5G might be helping some of you, but it's not a, you know, silver bullet, a magic bullet to, you know, save, save everything. If you look at it, 5G is an urban technology, first of all. It's not even a suburban technology and not to mention rural. So your country homes, you know, good luck. Um, I live in the suburban areas, you know, I'm also, you know, tough luck. So if you live in, you know, downtown cities and so forth, then that's where you might see sometimes something called 5G, but, you know, next decade at the earliest. I mean, there's not even a standard yet, so, you know, of course, people are selling 5G technology, but I'll come to that in a moment. So you can buy yourself 5G already today. It's not called 5G, but it's there. Um, the, uh, one of the marketing speeches for 5G is, you know, gigabit speed and low latency and so forth. I mean, that's many of you probably have heard about that, you know, gigabits to everybody and, you know, so forth and sub under one millisecond latency. Well, if anyone has heard of technology called 802.11 and, you know, called Wi-Fi, I mean, you get gigabit speeds and low latency today by going to a store and buying 802.11 AC base station and Actually, at least, uh, if I remember right, at least some, you know, Apple products and high-end smartphones and so forth have AC included, so you get gigabit. So if you want to experience 5G today, you just go and buy an 802.11 AC base station at home, and then you have a gigabit, and you can say you have 5G at home. Cost a few hundred euros. So not sure what the, you know, thing here is. Of course, you know, when you start discussing with, with, with uh, experts of the area, then, you know, they start raising the point about, you know, being mobile and having kind of a gigabit connectivity while moving. But again, then we are talking about, you know, base station uh, densities of, you know, let's say one base station every, you know, 50 meters. Every land post has a base station, 5G base station and so forth. So you start to do the map that, you know, how many land posts there are in Finland, for example, and so how many base stations do you need? And how many lampposts are there, you know, outside of, you know, big city areas? Of course, highways and so forth. But, I mean, if you want to experience 5G, just go and buy an AC device. Or, you know, if you want, you know, super 6G, then you buy an 802.11 AD, which is multi-gigabit. It's not in the stores yet, but I think that's the next, next evolution. And there's a lot of these 802.11s. 802.11 A and some letter added, which gives you, you know, promises, you know, your kind of marketing speech of 5G connectivity. It's not called 5G, but it's the same kind of the performance, if you will. Then, you know, some, in some papers you can see that 5G is about the integration of 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, and so forth. So kind of it's something that, you know, it's seamless and you don't see anything happening and it just works by magic. Well, guess what? My phone does that today. I mean, my tablet does that today, so, you know, 
if I'm at, at the office, it use, typically uses Wi-Fi, and if I'm not, then it uses mobile. I don't do anything, it just uses whatever is available. So no, that, that already is today. So if you get an 802.11ac tablet, then you have, a, you have 5G because it, you, it has gigabits and then it does, you know, switches radios. So in that sense, that doesn't really still bring anything, anything new to the table. This is a nice picture. Uh, there's a reference underneath GSMA intelligence. Uh, picturing um, what is available kind of today, the, the white part, and then the, the green, the gray part about things that uh, 5G is supposed to bring you. And if you look at it, you know, carefully there's, you know, uh, autonomous driving and, you know, augmented reality, then tactile internet is something a super version of Internet of Things, I think, something like that. It's not one of these next, next you know, generation buzzwords. But uh, there's not really anything that, you know, dramatically changes, you know, your everyday life, if you look at it. I mean, um, 5G is not kind of the, tech, the thing that changes your everyday connect communication or connectivity or, you know, your you know, social media services and stuff like that. It's, if you look at really the deep down the use cases and drivers for 5G, it's pretty much B2B. So business to business you, you know, use cases, not really consumer use cases. Consumer connectivity and you know, it's Wi-Fi and 2G and 3G and 4G, still for the next five to 10 years at least. So 5G isn't really the kind of answer to this. There, there's bound to be some other answer to these, you know, downwards trends and hopefully, you know, getting the trend curves back up. So, of course, you know, the, by end, well, ending this discussion, of course, the interesting thing that I have already pointed out, and, you know, I'll probably do that just for the fun of it, you know, uh, later this year, it's, of course, interesting to look at what the Q4 this year looks like in terms of, you know, Finnish market and the evolution and what the next year looks like and where the trends are. Are we going on a downward scale or are we going upwards? So, you know, is it the file fall, fall or rise in terms of, you know, the quality that people are getting in, at least on the Finnish market? But that's the end of my talk. I think I roughly used what I was supposed to add. Was there a question answers round arguments, you know, so forth. There's at least one argument or disagreement. Hello, my name is Simo Salo. Just a question about the technology. All your curves, they were about uh, uh, uploading and downloading data. Yeah. But I do use my phone also for telephone calls. Sure. How, how do they go through the system nowadays? If I'm connected to 4G, do I for use 4G when, most, I, mostly, when I make a phone call or how is it now organized? Uh, mostly, mostly it's still 2G, 3G phone calls. I mean, it's circuit switch calls, so it's still you know, using 3G as the voice. I mean, there is this uh, voice over LTE technology which is emerging and there's a few devices that can do that. But I would expect that it's end of the decade when, you know, people really have, you know, 4G phone calls. So it's still 3G. Do the telephone calls have any significance on your, on your curves? Do they uh, the, the, put the, the pressure have, on, the, on the net? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we thought a lot about, you know, can we, how can we kind of uh, study or could we study phone calls and stuff? And, on, on the device, but the mobile device APIs are not that flexible that we could, you know, study phone calls. It would kind of be that we would need to start m making phone calls and see whether they go through or not, and that's, you know, beyond what we want to do. I mean, we use data, and that's about it. Uh, the only thing that I can, which uh, is slightly related to that, uh, I didn't take the picture in this, in this uh, talk because there's limited time, but if you look at, for some network reliability, then if for some data, call, data connectivity doesn't go through, then chances are phone calls will not, neither go through. 
So from there you might see some, some differences in, in, uh, in the network reliability. But uh, apart from that, it's difficult to say about the phone calls. Does anybody else have a question? Please raise your hand. Nobody? Ah. Also a question regarding technology. So uh, uh, what new technologies does 5G actually include potentially? You said that the standard doesn't exist, but, but what could it I include? Well, um, I guess, well, since it, 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 need, it means different things to different users and different people and different companies, so it's difficult. As far as I understand, it's a new, some new air interfaces and, you know, Dense, dense networks and so forth and higher capacity and what have you. So, you know, you take an 8 to level 11 and, you know, extend that and, you know, pimp that to be a better, you know, faster connectivity. But if you look at, I mean, the, all the use cases on the GSMA intelligence, you know, slide, then uh, the other is kind of low bit rate or high bit rate, low latency use cases. So it seems to imply that, you know, that's one of the big things. But actually the GSMA intelligence report, you can probably find it online. Um, it was pretty interesting to read. I mean, looking at, you know, different use cases and, you know, different, you know, expectations and realities and so forth. So you might Google that. It was pretty, pretty nice, you know, summary. But no one knows what 5G is. I mean, there's only these, you know, buzzwords and, you know, so forth. Uh, the speed uh, and uh, customer satisfaction uh, trends uh, seemed very interesting, but have you done any comparisons uh, between those trends and uh, operator finance trends and uh, operator customer number trends or trends in right. uh, the finance, yeah. uh, financial situation? Well, if, the if the data is available, then, you know, of course you could probably, you know, do uh, combine kind of you know uh, number of customers and uh, but at, le at least if you look at you know the bit rate trends and if p then uh, it seems at least to me it looks like there's one operator who has um, or is either investing in in network capacity or otherwise you know the uh, typical quality their customer gets is you know increasing. And these two seem to be doing that. They maybe sold too many subscriptions lately. <laughs> yeah, and that's meaning that you know the averages are you know, and the, uh, the average uh, expectation or experience people are getting is, is uh, let's say not not tremendous anymore. That sounds very plausible. Seems like like we don't have any other questions. So thank you again. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>
so what does a VP for digitalization at Cargotech do? So, so that, that is a role we have. I, I will come, come to uh, how our, our business is organized, but uh, basically the role is more or less to support and, and kind of uh, catalyze the activities in our businesses to, to utilize digitalization as a tool for business renewal. So that means many things, but uh, let's see. We'll touch, touch those things later on in the presentation. So um, I, I wasn't given a really specific topic. So as I said, I chose some of the topics that I want to share with you. So I talk a little bit overall about uh, uh, how, how we see the digital transformation impacting us and uh, how, how we have organized ourselves internally to take the uh, benefit of this big, big, big trend. And uh, of course, I want to show some concrete examples of uh, digital services, uh, how we utilize digitalization uh, in our business. So um, this is not about, uh, let's say, company presentation as much, but it's so much, but, but uh, really I want to put this into a very concrete context. So, so I want to share something that we have and uh, talk a little bit about uh, new ways of, of collaboration, exploration, and, and so forth. So that's about uh, the presentation. Um, as said, I'm not going into the details of the company, but it's good to, good to uh, give some, some kind of uh, understanding how the business, business is, uh, what, what kind of business we're actually talking about, and uh, what kind of things we are kind of selling in, in the end. And um, um, first of all, Cargotech is, is um, kind of uh, spread into three business areas. We call Kalmar, Hayab, and, and McGregor, which are you could say independent businesses themselves or companies, but um, uh, they all belong to the Cargotech. And uh, uh, they are operating, first of all, Kalmar in, in the, um, let's say, container handling business in, uh, and providing uh, production services for our customers in, in terminals, ports and terminals, and also in heavy industry. So uh, some examples, if you, if you think about digitalization, then, then of course, um, um, all these uh, big machines that are that are basically handling containers in the in the in the terminals. Uh, of course, they 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 have lots of uh, capabilities to to measure what they are doing, what measure the uh, kind of condition in which the con uh, machine is, and also they have the connectivity capability to to communicate the data either to the customers in the terminals or or then also also kind of remotely to our our uh, let's say big data services in the, in the cloud. Um, but then, uh, more importantly, I, I would say that the big, big trend in, in terminal, terminals nowadays is actually automation. And by automation, I don't mean just to automation things or control things that you have on, on the machines, but, but rather on a, on a terminal level. And uh, for example, we have some deliveries of uh, of uh, uh, quite sophisticated equipment um, that are fully automatic. So they are operating in the, these terminals, container terminals, and these uh, shuttle carriers or shuttle carriers, they are picking up the container independently without any, any remote or manual operation. And they are taking, up, taking these containers to, to the yard, sorry, to the yard, and another, another type of automated, fully automated, Sorry, this is jumping a little bit back and forth. Automated uh, stacking crane picks up the container and puts it on the, on the yard and so forth. So there's a lot of automation involved in the process, at the process level already in, in, the, in the terminals. So this is an interesting trend that is uh, going, to, going to go forward fast in the future as well. Um, then some examples of HIAB. So um, at least in Finland, um, these kind of uh, loader cranes that, are, that sit on, on, on trucks. They are called HIABs, although they are not all HIAB. Um, so, so this is a quite a strong brand, actually, and, uh, and has a long history, also so about 70 years of history. And, uh, and um, of course, uh, these kind of uh, loader cranes are, are frequently used for, for many kinds of purposes, handling all kinds of loads and cargo that you, you, you are kind of carry with the, with the trucks on the land side. But also Hayab has other, other, other things too in the, in the portfolio. 
Um, one example is this uh, tail lift that is in the lower, lower middle picture. And uh, this is definitely my, my favorite example of, of, of our products. So, so it's relatively simple in a way. It's opening the back of the truck and going down and picking up the load and putting it, the, the tail lift back, back to the up, upright position again. How do you digitalize that one? How do you create digital business out of this kind of equipment? That's a very good question. And if you if you purely focus on the on the let's say the equipment and uh, and its its digital capabilities, then you're kind of lost in that game because it's it's not so expensive equi equipment so that you could afford put all the sensors and all that stuff on top of it, all the connectivity stuff, and and create uh, create a database business out of that that equipment itself. But uh, if you look at it from a, another perspective, like uh, look a little bit what the, what the customers are actually doing with the device and uh, how, how important is that device actually in their processes and, and so forth. So maybe then you find a good reason for, for also, also connecting, for example, this kind of device. Then finally, McGregor is the third business area and uh, McGregor is basically providing all kinds of uh, uh, load and cargo handling solutions on, on ships vessels. For example, there you have a container vessel. So McGregor is providing this, this lashing systems and, and also software solutions for, for kind of optimizing the load, uh, loading of the, of the ship and, and so forth. So it's, it's a quite a big range of different things in the, in the, in the group and uh, this makes it very, very interesting uh, from my perspective as well. So then the good question in a way is that how, how are these uh, previous things somehow connected and, and, and interlinked? So, and what does this uh, equipment have, have to do with the digitalization and, and so forth? So we see basically that uh, our equipment are, are actually uh, present in, in all over the world, first of all, but they are very much present everywhere where, where loads and cargoes are handled. And this actually gives us a kind, quite, quite unique opportunity also, also to kind of get a little bit more information about what is going through all these uh, logistics chains that are there, that are uh, moving, moving the cargoes all over the world. So we have lots of interesting opportunities in this space and I try to kind of uh, concretize this, this a little bit uh, during my speech. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the, on the company, how we see the, the digitalization and, and overall where is the world going, where is our industry going actually and uh, what, what kind of uh, impact digitalization has, has in this one. Uh, as you saw in the previous slides, we have quite, uh, quite a big range of different kind of, uh, let's say, equipment available for our customers uh, for, for, to solve their, their uh, load handling and, and cargo handling uh, problems, but um, to be honest, uh, first of all, we are pretty good in, by the way, in this, this uh, category. So, so we are typically globally um, number ones or twos or threes in the, in the product, product businesses. So they are quite uh, well, well known and, and uh, uh, good products in, in a sense. And uh, so that's why we dare to say that we are we would kind of uh, in the position that we are in a, in a way leaders in, in cargo handling equipment. But uh, as every other industrial company, uh, everybody's looking at the services. Why? Because it's, it's of course, uh, kind of compensating also for the downturns and, and so forth, typically what you have in the product sales. So that is very relevant for the company in, in the long run to, to, to be able to kind of balance also the ups and downs of, of, of the market situations and so forth. So services are highly important for us, but also we see that uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential, a lot of uh, possibilities for our customers uh, in, in services. So if, if we are able to, for example, extend the lifetime of a, an equipment with uh, proper maintenance plans and, and, and contracts and, and services on top, so that gives a lot of value actually to customers. If you think uh, these, these big, big cranes, for example, they are pretty expensive devices. So if, you, if you're able to kind of extend the life, lifetime of, of this equipment, then of course uh, that, that is a pure benefit to, to our customers. So we strongly believe in, in, in true services, industrial services, not just maintenance and, and, and these things, but, but uh, we have a lot, lot to actually develop in, in, in this uh, 
uh, this area. And uh, that is definitely the, the focus point at the moment, uh, how, how we uh, kind of make a change from this kind of product company to, to more services company that we actually serve our customers, customers better. But uh, then if we look into a little bit further on in the future, we talk about taking the leadership in, in, in basically intelligent cargo handling. And that is the kind of our current strategy also that, uh, that we more or less, uh, we have seen the importance of, of software solutions and, uh, and automation, digitalization in this world. And, and uh, we strongly believe in, in, in that the world is, is going into that direction that actually the the more value uh, actually comes from these software software uh, based services to our customers and also we want to be be in that that game and 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 so help uh, help serve our customers better so this is this is kind of the our, our 2020 target to to really increase in in software and services and and but that doesn't say that we should uh, forget our product business because it's it's very essential also so you can see here that uh, uh, our strategy totally emphasizes this digitalization overall. If you define digitalization uh, as, as, as kind of including all these, uh, let's say, data and connectivity and automation and, and, and kind of digital services. So, so this strongly emphasizes our, our uh, kind of uh, need for, to become, become more digitalized. So what is digitalization then? How you define that? We see it as, a, as basically as a, as a tool. This is just one, one definition, by the way, but uh, everybody talks about it, so it's good to maybe put into some context. Um, we see it as a, as a tool to really renew the business. So it's, it's uh, first of all, I think it's important to say it, it's a tool. It's an en enabler. It's not the kind of the target of, of let's let's uh, digitalize something so, so that it's not that uh, we would take a look around us and see that okay everybody's talking about digitalization so we need to do that as well it's not about that we see that as an important tool and of course it's a big mega trend as well uh, but it's it's the target is actually not digitalization as such, such but it's it's really the business renewal so what that then means of course uh, Things like uh, marketing and sales, w they can utilize a lot, uh, all kinds of uh, digital channels nowadays much better. So, so uh, there's data available about our customers, how they are reacting to those, those uh, for example, ma marketing messages that we provide and so forth. So we get better visibility also to our customer base through digital channels. Uh, services are becoming more di digital, so everybody's has a smartphone or, or tablet and so forth. So we are used as, as uh, consumers to have everybody, ev everything, all the services in our pockets, basically. So why wouldn't the industrial customers also require that? Digitalization also uh, helps in streamlining the kind of the business processes, internal processes, so we can eliminate the unnecessary work, basically. But it's also a tool to come up with uh, new kind of business concept, business models, and, and earning logics. And, and that's a kind of a way to also impact the, the markets in a way that uh, um, it's great that if we come up with good concepts and new, new things, but, but also you have to understand that the, the, the kind of environment where our customers are, are they willing to accept our new approaches, new, new ways of working, and new ways of, for example, charging of our services. Are we just going to sell the equipment as, as such, as transactional business? Or are we go, moving really towards services that we are actually charging the equipment and the service or, or the maintenance as a service based on, for example, number of lifts that the, the equipment is, is doing? So these kind of things uh, are, are happening and, and, uh, and uh, being, being uh, considered, of course. So overall, uh, I would say that it's not enough just to think inside the company how, how the digitalization is, is impacting us, and, uh, but it's, it's very important to understand the kind of the logic 
how, how we are going to impact our, our customers, how the markets are going to change if we are going to uh, implement a new type of business model, for example. And there could be also the kind of societal, so societal aspect to it. So this is easy to understand if you think about the kind of, kind of consumer example, B2C examples of digitalization, take, take all these Ubers and, 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 and uh, Airbnbs, for example. So they, have a, they, they, they had a, a big impact also, also from societal per, uh, perspective. For example, it's not trivial that you can do these services or if they are, for example, allowed at all in, in, the, uh, in certain countries. So you need to really understand uh, how our, our new ways of working, for example, are going to, to impact the, the society as well. This is relevant for B2B as well. Okay, um, how we see this uh, further? So, so you can think of digitalization as, a, as, as I said, a tool for renewable, business renewable, and, and you can either focus, of course, on the, on the growth, company growth, uh, so that means you're basically looking at some, some new opportunities uh, that are maybe uh, adjacent to your current business, uh, or they can be something totally new, something uh, that is not even close to your core business, but, but something relevant to, to, to the industry. Or then you can focus on the on the more on the efficient, efficiency side of the of things, so so improving the process efficiency and, and so forth. But if you are able to put these two together and, and come up with something radically new as a business model, but also develop it so that it's really scalable and it also kind of uh, gets good attention from from your uh, customers, then then we're talking talking about disruptive. Uh, new new ways of uh, selling selling things basically, but um, this is kind of well known. But um, what I want to emphasize this is this is not the whole thru truth in a way that uh, this is just enough to come up with a business model and then make it scalable and, and bring it to the market. What it requires from internal perspective is, is obviously actually if you, if you look at the kind of situation where, for example, our kind of companies today. It, it requires totally a new kind of uh, way of working uh, and, and also cul culture inside the company to be able to come up with these kind of new, new um, uh, business models. And also, it's very important to have the appropriate architecture in place for, for digital. So I will come back to those, those, those things a bit, bit later. But th this is well understood and uh, there are just some examples uh, of our current development uh, that we're we're doing. I don't, I'm not going into the details of those ones, but uh, just to just to highlight that it's important to work on different areas and different things, and you need to be improving the efficiency while you are considering new ways of doing business. So, so all this together then then will help you go forward. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, Ubers and, and uh, Airbnbs because you, everybody knows these things already. But I, I still wanted to take this slide because um, there's one thing. I want to focus on more like the, what was the actual trick that Ubers and, and Airbnbs did? So why they were so successful? Have you ever considered that one? Maybe some, some comments uh, we could have the discussion maybe afterwards, but I, uh, of course the trick there is, is that uh, they, what they did was, was basically they provided the kind of platform, digital platform. and. Uh, what that platform does is, is, is actually it's, it's managing and optimizing the use of, of uh, existing physical assets in a better way. And this is interesting because that, that could actually apply also to our kind of uh, business as well. So our customers are having, uh, let's say, physical assets that are typically pretty expensive ones as well. So, so as I said, it's kind of, take for example a port. It, it takes a lot of money actually to build a port, uh, and the equipment is not actually that big part of the of the of the co overall cost. But uh, but anyway, uh, I mean there 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 are huge money uh, in and is investments in in these, these infrastructures and so forth. Um, so it's it's kind of um, appealing to to think about a little bit if if this kind of digital play could actually help to, to, to optimize the, the utilization of these kind of assets as well, as it's, as it's been done already for taxis and, and, 
apartments. But this is just for some food for thought. Then how we see digitalization actually and how that will impact us and, and, and what are we actually focusing on there. The first thing that uh, is, is stated here is, is the data. We are very much looking into the opportunities that we could um, use data for to come up with, for example, new kind of business models as well as uh, improving uh, our current businesses like, uh, for example, maintenance, maintenance and, and, and service processes, how, how we can enhance and improve those ones with the utilization of more, more data. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities in, later on when, when we really connect in the, in the, let's say, overall cargo flow and uh, get a lot of information from different stakeholders in the, in, in the whole logistics chain and, and, and provide that uh, uh, based on that uh, new type of optimization services for our customers. So th there are lots of opportunities in this space. I will come, come to some concrete examples later on. But to be able to play this game, um, we have certain, certain like uh, midterm targets for our uh, strategy. And uh, one very clear one is, is that we need to have all this, all, all new equipment that we, we produce connected by, by 2018. This is something that we are, of course, heavily working with at the moment because 2018 is just around the corner. And uh, the reason for this is ob obviously that uh, if you can't get things connected, you don't get the data and, and you can't play the game that we're going to, going to play. So this is quite tricky. You saw the kind of width of, of our product portfolio. So there are really massive amount of, of different kind of products actually. That, and, and if you really go to the level that, okay, hey, I need this kind of module to be kind of connected to my equipment and I need to have the capability to communicate here and need the software to be able to read everything from here and communicate that. We need the cloud services, we need everything on top of it to be able to build the services. So that's a big, big uh, uh, kind of um, development that is actually required to, to do that for, for such a big uh, product portfolio. But this is the, the path we've taken now. Something about the opportunities in this space. Uh, last slide was about more like just uh, in general, what are the opportunities? But this is a little bit more concrete. We did kind of uh, analysis on the on the opportunities in the in the container value chain, and if you if you not only focus on the terminal operations in the ports, but uh, but also consider the the shipping lines and and how they operate with the ports and how, what are the other other stakeholders in this this environment actually. Think from the, let's say somebody wants to ship a container all the way through the, the container value chain, all the way back, back to, the, to the, uh, the end customer who's, who's getting the products uh, and so forth. So it's, it's a long chain. It has multiple players and they have very interesting and different roles, roles in that one. But there's no single digital platform managing all this, these things. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, pen and paper type of uh, work and communication, emails, Excel sheets that you are needed currently to, to uh, make, make this uh, flow work. So, so uh, it's, it's really amazing how much uh, kind of old fashioned things are, are there in place. Um, we estimated this to be, to be kind of a 17 billion euros uh, kind of waste that exists in, in this kind of chain. Um, waste meaning, of course, it's not just a business, it's not business opportunity as such, but it's, it's kind of unnecessary work that is being done every year. Uh, and, and we estimated the size of that to be about 17 billion. So that gives some, some food for thought once again. Uh, think about uh, feasible, feasible uh, solutions that could help our customers in this, this value chain. Uh, and and uh, we could maybe reduce that waste by, by a significant number. So those are the, that, that is the kind of the industry, our business, our, our company, and, uh, and I want to spend a couple of slides to, on, on thinking about how then to, to make some progress, how to really organize ourselves uh, to drive the transformation in, in the company. And um, I have a couple of uh, 
general slides. So first of all, this, this is stolen with pride from, from consultants, so, so, but I have the source there. So um, this, is, this is about uh, kind of about the strategic building blocks, or, or basically it says that uh, the message here is that uh, this is not an R&D uh, exercise to, to transform the company to a digital one. So obviously there are, there are many other things that you need to also consider and do. So it's definitely not just R&D, but it's sure, for sure impacting R&D as well. If you are building new type of offerings for customers, you need to think about things like, okay, how do I enhance digitally the current product, for example. In our case, it means, okay, we have the tail lift example that I mentioned in the, in the beginning. So that's a pretty tricky one. So should I put all the sensors there? Should I have some kind of computing unit there and, and a, a gateway box to communicate the data and so forth? So this is the thinking we need to do. Um, should I develop data-driven services? Now that I get all the data, what, what shall I do with it? So for sure, you need to think about the data. You need to think about the analytics and all that. And you need the competencies as well, by the way, for analytics. It's not so, something that you kind of... Uh, have in built in your company. You have the business understanding, you have the uh, product understanding, but really the, the, let's say, hardcore mathematics is sometimes missing. Other digital services, what can we do with that? What are the software products, for example, that, that we should build? We do have our software division and, and, and they, they have a certain portfolio of software products as well. But it will, it will impact also the kind of core functions inside the company. So, so as I already mentioned, sales, sales and marketing activities are, are obviously taking a lot of benefit from digitalization. But, but you have to also um, focus on, on, on what is the thing that you want to do. Is, is it that you want to be on the social media? Is that the thing that you do? Or is it that you are actually utilizing the information that you gather through all the, all the uh, channels to your customers and, and you doing the analytics on top of that and they, then you get maybe lead generation or something like that as an application. So some examples. So I, I, will, not go, I will not run through everything here, but uh, just, to, just to give an understanding that this, this is something that it really impacts uh, all the functions basically in, in, in the company if, if you do it seriously. There are a lot of ways to also accelerate and help a company to, to change. And everybody nowadays talk about, for example, startups. So how do you do startup collaboration? How do you interact with startups? And why do you do that, for example? Well, one explanation is, of course, that they are pretty fast. They have, if, if a startup wants to live, they have to be very actively understanding, discussing and understanding customer problems. They are right, right there in the customer interface getting all the, you know, things and uh, hints and, and uh, hidden signals from the customers to come up with the great concepts that get, can be then productized. They have to be there. They are quick. They move fast. They change direction and go, go forward. Um, in, in corporate like, like ours, it's sometimes a little bit different culture. So that's why it's important to, to be able to, you know, take the best parts of startup uh, culture and uh, approach uh, capabilities and maybe somehow collabor collaborate with, with them to, to get the same spirit inside a, a bigger corporation. You can do uh, traditional merger and acquisition type of uh, activities, of course, to, to speed up. You can buy a business, you can buy a digital business. Uh, and and that, is, that is, of course, doable, but, but how to integrate that to your core business, that's another story. We have taken quite many of uh, these kind of uh, catalyzing or accelerator approaches ourselves. Um, for example, we have this kind of digital program management office, office type of approach that, that we are at the, at the corporate level following up very closely the activities that the businesses have and also help them uh, to, to go, go forward and, and, and speed up with a certain type of developments. I will talk a little bit later about that, that too. So this is general. This impacts everything in, inside the company. Then how do you efficiently this is also, by the way, stolen with pride from, from another con consultancy, but uh, I still have the source there. Um, how do you organize the digital activities within the company? So you have lots of uh, different approaches you can, you can think of. Uh, we, for example, we have a business, sorry, this is jumping back and forth. 
we have the business lines uh, or business units or divisions um, within the company. We have business areas, which are the three companies, and then they, these uh, business areas have business units inside them. So you could easily think that uh, it's quite uh, scattered in a way, and uh, uh, all the business units have, have their, their business targets and, 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 and so forth. So uh, this, is, this is, in a way, the setup in the, in the company, and it's, it's uh, very useful when you think about the performance and how, how to drive that form and for, forward, in, in typically, in this kind of business. But uh, when it comes to organizing the digital activities around that, so with this kind of uh, uncoordinated setup, you, you easily end up uh, having some duplicate work done in different business units if you're not coordinating that at all. So that's why uh, we have chosen actually the, the approach that we have some, some level of uh, central coordination uh, ac across the businesses uh, and, and at least we are aware of what we are doing in different areas and different units and also we're kind of guiding and advising these units to, to collaborate uh, whenever there's a, there's a good reason for doing that. So we're trying to build the visibility of what's happening in all around the uh, company with this kind of central coordination also. But it's not just about coordination, it's really about catalyzing things and making them go, going forward. Um, uh, the next step, if, if you would take a step to, uh, towards more centralized uh, governance and, and even incubation, then that's the third one. So, so in that case, you kind of take uh, Take a small team, small team uh, centrally and, and really let them work and drive the digital activities in the company, but so that uh, they, they are interacting heavily with the business units and taking the resources uh, from the business units actually to the central incubation to, to come up quickly, quickly with some new type of concepts. And these kind of models uh, have been uh, quite successful in certain type of businesses actually. Um, one step further, if, if you think about this also from the, let's say, maturity perspective, so how mature are you with, the, with this digital agenda and, and organization, then the, maybe the last phase is typically so that uh, you have first come to this very centralized uh, um, uh, setup, but, but you, the next step you take is actually that you have, have the digital teams in, within the uh, business units and you're well steering all those teams uh, from a central point of view. So it's, it's kind of the work, work gets embedded into the units and there are kind of teams, teams that are working on the, on the agenda, but, but it's centrally managed still. I, I suggested already that uh, um, this has something to do with uh, uh, maturity of, of, of uh, digitalization in, in, the, in the company in, in some sense. So um, here I, I have put this, uh, this uh, uh, maturity on the, on the left hand side and, and you see starting from the novice level or below novice level you, you go up to the digital champion level and, uh, and it's very often in the, uh, if you look into a little bit details how, how companies have been organized around digitalization so you, you often see this kind of trend that uh, first they start with uh, let's say novice level, novice level and uh, um, things and, and, and activities are very decentralized, so uncoordinated. But once they start to um, centralize things a little bit, they go up with the maturity and very typically they, they go to the right hand side, so, so the very central, centralized uh, uh, governance and, and, and incubation uh, centers and so forth. And, and they come, go quite uh, high on the, on the maturity also at the, at the same time, but uh, eventually they go back a little bit to the embedded mode. So that gives, uh, typically, uh, it takes you to, to, to the highest level in, in maturity as well, if you manage to operate your, your digital business so in, in this, this way. So this is interesting, and, and um, you may want to ask or, or check where we are with this one. So. Uh, at least from the governance uh, side, I, I, I definitely agree that we are somewhere between maybe two and three. We have a little bit of both, uh, depending a little bit on the on the which kind of which part of the business we are talking about. But uh, we are somewhere there. I'll maybe skip this one and go more forward. Actually, I, I want to share some some uh, some things, uh, concrete things. I promise some, something concrete, by the way. So um, we have worked uh, uh, on, on digitalization. If you, if you 
think uh, that it covers uh, uh, all, all this automation development that we've done over the decades and, and, and so forth. So, of course, uh, we have been working as a company on, on many, many things for, for a long time, and we do have some, let's say, digital offerings uh, that, that we are currently capable to, to provide to our customers. And, and there are things like, for example, this terminal automation and, and automated, automated cranes and all that. But uh, what is interesting is that uh, recently, during uh, I have been in this position for one year approximately now, and uh, during this year I've seen quite a lot of uh, different kind of moves in, uh, within within cargo tech, and uh, there are things that are uh, related to internal digitalization using uh, uh, new new novel tools for 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 example this uh, a priori is related to to kind of design design and, and, and cost, basically, how you optimize design based on cost and, and so forth, that kind of tool. But uh, there are other things like uh, uh, teams, uh, uh, kind of dedicated teams working in certain area, trying to come up with a new, new type of services for our customers and so forth. And a lot of uh, new type of uh, approaches, uh, digital services and all that, and, and I will cover a couple of, couple of them later on. But we have intro introduced also some, some um, really uh, interesting new products. For example, the High Vision product for High Up was launched in, 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 uh, in the spring. So basically utilizing the Oculus Rift uh, goggles uh, so that uh, the, op uh, the, the uh, truck driver here who is, who is uh, operating a forestry crane that is attached to the, to the, uh, to the truck uh, he can actually operate that crane from the uh, truck cabin instead of climbing up to the to the truck and uh, and a small cabin there that you have for operating the forest crane. So with these goggles, actually, we bring the kind of the whole world in, into into the eyes of the operator, and he can look around as if he was sitting in the in the outside in cold in in snow and uh, and and so forth in in in, in back of the truck. Um, this actually has a lot of uh, safety benefits as well, because quite many many accidents happen when the truck uh, driver is, is climbing up to the to the cabin on the on the forest crane. So these kind of things we have uh, introduced, uh, for example, and, and I will show one example in a little bit more detail, which is which is this. Let's see how the sound works. I'm not sure how how it's going to be, but let's see. Is the sound, by the way, coming. Okay, never mind. Uh, I, I can explain. It doesn't matter. It's just somebody talking. Uh, I can talk while while we show the show the video. So um, this is about how we utilize data data better in in the terminals. And this is uh, all the video is all about. Uh, this is actually a product launch that we did uh, in 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 uh, uh, June this year. And what you can actually see there is is uh, is a uh, concept. Uh, that we launched in, in TOC, TOC uh, Fair this year. And what this is all about. So this is about the kind of, uh, I can tell you a story behind this. So, so many, many years, for many years, there has been, let's say, this kind of telematic systems on the, on the, on the markets and, and telematic system for getting the data from uh, one, one crane here and one, the other crane there. So these have been there on, on the markets for a long time, but uh, what, uh, we kind of uh, started to think about was, was that, hey, what do we do with the data? So l take a look at this terminal, for example. They have uh, equipment from this manufacturer, this manufacturer, and that manufacturer. So all these uh, different manufacturers have some kind of a telematic system. So they can provide the data from the equipment to, uh, to, to, be, to be seen by the, by the uh, terminal operators. So they have three, maybe, maybe three different systems where they look into the equipment data. And that's not really what the customers are interested in. And we started to really think about this. We, uh, we had a very intensive development project around this. Started to discuss with customers about their pain points, their, their uh, 
problems in the, in the terminal. So, and and on, on the other hand, what, about the value that this kind of data could bring them. And we, this team, team that was developing this realized uh, m many things quickly that uh, the, the terminal operators, they need to have a kind of full visibility to all, all uh, operations in the, in the, in the terminal. They, they are not uh, needing the data as such, but they need information based on the data. And, and this is basically, this Columnar Insight uh, product is, is all about that. So how we utilize fully the, all the information sources that, that we have in the terminals, how we connect them all together to give uh, values like uh, how much money uh, am I spending for my operations at this moment? Or how much money am I getting with my operations at this moment? So it's easy to kind of calculate that, okay, now I'm making profit actually. And if I, if I do a little bit this and that, I see my profit curve go up. So, so we talk the same language with the terminal operators with this, this concept. And um, this is just, just one, one example of, of, of the kind of possibilities that we have in this space. So we have uh, also in this, this we connect, uh, connect the, the uh, maintenance management system to the same platform. So basically it's uh, possible to not only see the operations and their kind of profitability, but also the kind of uh, maintenance action, planned maintenance actions in the, in the terminal. So basically the operations personnel may, may say that, okay, a ship is arriving. I need to have at least, let's say, five this type of machines to, to unload the ship. So I better not have them in, in, in the maintenance workshop at the same time. So, so it's a quite simple things, but bringing all that information together is, is, the, is the key actually. So this is one, one simple way to, to, you know, really, really utilize the data, data in our business. High vision, I already mentioned, no need to go, go into that one anymore. And, and last example I have here, here is, is the, from McGregor side. So um, this is interesting because McGregor is, is, is providing this uh, kind of remote troubleshooting services or remote uh, services basically 24 seven. Uh, why? Because they, they actually originally, McGregor has built this kind of offshore cranes which are actually pretty, pretty uh, uh, complicated machines and they, they, have, they are being used just in the middle of the seas so they are operating uh, around oil fields or wind uh, farms or, or then they are doing some operations from the bottom of the sea with the cranes, for example. Um, what happens if that crane fails? The whole ship has been built actually to bring the crane from the shore to the offshore, to the sea. So it means basically that the ship has to go back to the shore in the old tra traditional way and, and do the maintenance services there and then go back to the middle of the sea. Basically that's uh, maybe four days or five days out of work. And that's a lot of money actually for the customer, uh, lost money. So that's why we have these remote uh, capabilities to, to help the customers to solve the problems remotely over satellite communication and so forth. So, so this is one way uh, in a way that, that actually brings a lot of value to, to, to our customers because with this we can we really, really uh, solve the downtime problems. So these are some um, ex examples of, of practical examples of, of what we then do with digitalization, connectivity, and so forth. And there are, there are other, others as well. Um, I would have been happy to talk uh, all the way till tomorrow morning, but uh, I, I understand uh, everybody has something, something else to do, so tonight even. So I'll skip the kind of um, uh, hackathon stuff that I had also, also here, uh, go to some of the final, final concluding remarks. Just uh, want to emphasize once again the importance of uh, company strategy. It has to be built so that it's support, it supports fully digital transformation if you want to transform as a company into a more digital one. So this is like obvious thing, but, but if it's not really uh, happening, then, then if you don't have the support from, uh, from the top management, then, then there's no way to do this. Uh, I, I told about uh, the kind of coordination and, and, and importance of having some centralized functions around uh, how you organize the work around digitalization. Um, many, many companies have, um, have this kind of CDO role, so basically chief digital officer role. Um, we have a kind of up-to-date CIO role, so, so uh, chief information uh, officer. 
but we understand that uh, that should also cover the, the digitalization side as well. So um, typically things go from uncoordinated to centralized and then back to some kind of embedded mode when you organize the, the, this kind of area within the company. And, but but it's, it's so important to understand that uh, it's not just about, it's not an R&D or IT exercise, but it, this is really about so, so something that uh, uh, changes many, many things, including strategy. Uh, you have to think about, do you have the capabilities in-house, uh, the right capabilities to do this, and it will change probably organization and management things as, as well in, inside. The last thing was about uh, hackathons. I would have loved to talk about that, but maybe another, not at another time. Um, the message there is uh, doing things all your own in, inside the uh, company. It's, it's not going to work, most likely. Critical things you need to do, core business you need to do yourself. But uh, for even for innovation, exploration, cre creating new, new uh, services, uh, digital business, you need definitely help if you're uh, like a company with a uh, background of, of uh, uh, let's say, mechanical engineering and, and, and so forth. So, so it is important to be open, open and capable, capable of, of collaboration. So with these uh, thoughts, I, I, I stop here and uh, happy to answer some, some questions as well, if the audience may, may have. Yes, I'm Simo Salo. Uh, you quickly mentioned the, mentioned the hackathon idea, and uh, I saw on your website that you, you've been arranging a couple yeah. of them, and uh, that sounds uh, very great about creating uh, to build ecosystems. And, uh, well, if you don't have the time to talk about more, more of them, so you can skip it, but uh, mm -hmm. if you can bring up some results mm -hmm. about the hackathons, maybe that. But on the other hand, you must also have a, a patent portfolio, I guess, yeah. the company has it. So can you describe how big is your patent portfolio? Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been personally so much uh, involved in, in the patent for portfolio things. So, so it's something, of course, that we, we have a long heritage of, uh, let's say, R&D, and, and we have been building great products, and, and there's lots of patents, of course, behind those products. But uh, I'm, I'm totally honest, I, I can't give you a number here. I need to do my homework better, so, so I, I'm not going to, to guess. But it's, it's of course very important in this, this kind of... Uh, this. Hi, my name is Pertu Orla. So we have seen software as a service, we have seen mobility as a service. Will we see cargo as a service by Kalmar, by cargo tech or some in a way outside or will we be see first terminal as a service yeah that's of course very very good good question so uh, of course it depends what you mean cargo as a service uh, obviously you can order uh, delivery of cargo already today from certain certain companies but um, terminal as a service yeah why not uh, when it, that will be, um, let's see. But uh, of course, I, everything's possible. I mean, but uh, it's it's very complicated to, to be honest. There are a lot of uh, stakeholders in that game. Uh, there are some limitations, also also how how we can do business, and how terminals can do business. Labor unions take one, one example. So it's it's there are there are things that you need to consider. It's it's uh, technically could be possible right away, but uh, it's more like the business. You have to really, really uh, deep dive into the business and, uh, and uh, understand fully the logic. Uh, okay, uh, Seppo Borenius. So how do you see cyber security? And you, you see a lot of such activity and how concerned are you about that some malicious worm would mm -hmm. attack your cargo handling systems yeah, for blackmailing yeah, purposes, yeah. for example? Yeah. Of course, that's, uh, that's one of the cornerstones of all the design for, for, for the connectivity, for example. Um, of course, we are 
doing whatever we can and the best we can uh, in, in that sense and, and also utilizing, of course, uh, all the possible help in, in, in that so, so that, uh, that, well, let's say so it's, it's definitely in the, it's, it's one of the key, key things that we focus on. Um, then on the other hand, um, um, there, there is of course uh, most of, the, oh, let's say the big, big, uh, let's take some big, big systems, uh, big cranes for example, the, the information they provide could be potentially uh, useful for some, somebody who's, who wants to kind of uh, do some attacks or you, you misutilize the information. So that, that is of course possible, but uh, for some very simple equipment for example, that might be a different case. So that the information is as such is not uh, so important for if you only have that information. Because then of course in the back office kind of we have all the other systems that we, you know, gather the data with and, and actually then can, can provide the services. So there are different aspects to that. But of course it's, uh, it's something that you can't forget and uh, can't overlook. Uh, it's, it's very important. Yeah, hi. Um, how would you compare your digital services or um, products to the ones that we, your competitors have, like Connect Cranes, or who is the digital leader of Crane World? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I, I heard these questions many times, actually. But, uh, of course, we, uh, if you look at, for example, that company you mentioned, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of the overlap of our portfolio, for sure, is, is there in certain areas, but on the other hand, then there are both companies have different areas and, and so forth. So it's, it's always uh, how, how do you want to compare it actually and which kind of uh, things you want to compare. And, uh, and uh, for sure there are, everybody has had this, this let's say connectivity solutions or that for, for several, several years for different type of machines. So that's nothing new, uh, everybody has it, but uh, um, yeah, uh, the approaches are maybe a little bit different, but uh, I, I don't want to do kind of a one-to-one -one comparison to anyone, but I, I would say we are quite, quite good also. Thank you. I guess that was all the questions. Uh, so thank you for your talk and uh, for the audience. Uh, I guess I'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay, thanks.